Hello, everyone. Welcome to Global Express. I'm Nina Gopal. This is the new Indian Express's weekly interaction with experts, where we analyze the impact of developments in our backyard, on our neighborhood, on India. Do click on the new Indian Express website and tweet and follow Global Express. So, Gaza is a seething mass of misery and grief. The retribution unleashed by Israel was precipitated by the brutal attack that was unleashed by Hamas on the Israeli settlements on October 7th. But as the world rallies to Israel, Washington and London and India empathizing with its unspeakable agony, uh, there are huge concerns over the humanitarian disaster that is unfolding, uh, unfolding among Palestinians trapped in Gaza. Over 3,700 people are already dead. Uh, the U.S. has announced now that it's it, that it's going to uh, be, uh, you know, that Israel will allow humanitarian aid to come through the Rafah crossing. But is there the risk now of a wider conflict? I mean, Hamas up the ante in such a way that it's raised questions about where they get their ammunition from, where they get their funding from, uh, you know, and uh, with the uh, today's uh, incident of, uh, you know, Israel, uh, I mean, of these, um, you know, uh, an attack even coming from Yemen, there's a great possibility that Iran could, uh, there could be a wider conflict that Iran could get involved. Welcome Italian journalist and historian Paolo Caldi, author of a new book, Hamas, From Resistance to Regime, who can decipher what makes this militant group tick what made Palestinians uh, in Gaza elect Hamas to office in 2006, and why Palestinians seem to support violent resistance, you know, rejecting Fatah and the Palestinian authorities, Mahmoud Abbas. What kind of uh, support does Hamas have in Gaza? Because I have it on very good authority from various people that Hamas is a rule of fear, that anyone who opposes that diktat pays a price. And how did they uh, pull off October 7th? You know, did they penetrate, uh, you know, a tech supergiant like Israel? And do they not, did they not expect an Israeli response? Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, for a, an attack which would then hurt ordinary Palestinians? Uh, would you like to come in, Ms. Karidi? Yes, I am in. Yeah. And uh, the first thing I wish to, to say is that uh, in this conversation, it lacks the Palestinian voice or the Palestinian voices. Because I'm an Italian journalist who lived in Jerusalem for 10 years. But I think that uh, after what the ambassador said, probably he would have called a Palestinian voice to answer. But otherwise, we are... Uh, Ms. Karidi, we did we have are, a Palestinian. Uh, just, just a moment. We did. We are again, we are inside a trap of narratives. And I mm. think what we need is to try with rationality and with the, of course, with the emotions of the war crimes that Hamas committed inside Israel. But we, with rationality, we have also to look at the panorama. Mm -hmm. If we speak about numbers, we are inside the dehumanization trap. There are the numbers of the Israeli civilians killed and massacred inside Israel. There are yeah. the numbers of the Palestinians bombarded as civilians, because not because of the hospital, because, but because of what of the bombardments before the hospital, in the nine days of bombardment before the hospital. We are thinking, we are uh, watching, at least witnessing at least more than 3,500 Palestinians in Gaza and so on and so forth. I don't want to, to, to make the list of the numbers because I think that each civilian is not a number is a mind, is a body, and it, uh, we it's a have human being. A human being, we are not to be uh, synced in the trap of the dehumanization. And I don't think that this kind of war on Gaza 
will uh, have a good, let's say, a good result for all the Middle East, for Israel, for Palestine, for the Middle East. I will come to this pre uh, to answer your question. Uh, and because what, I want what... to, uh, to answer your question, we have to yes. not to forget that um, that Gaza, the, the Gaza Strip, uh, has a blockade since 2007 when Hamas did a coup in Gaza. And when the fracture inside the political Palestine, the Palestinian political arena was cemented with a coup d'etat that, that Hamas did in Gaza. Yeah. So I understand also the Israeli perspective. But the blockade since 17 years, um, 16 years, did not bring peace to for the Israelis. And not only that, it caught in a cage not only Hamas, not only the military wing, but 2 million, 2.2 million of people, persons, individuals, uh, civilians. And this is the answer. Inside this cage, of course, and the, the subtitle of the updated uh, version of my book, because the first book uh, I wrote in 2009 in the Italian version, the first, uh, I mean, uh, the first victims of the blockade are again the civilians, uh, because they of course, there is not not uh, a majority uh, a consensus in Gaza for Hamas. Uh, the same amount we saw in two thousand and six, when all the international community gave paved the way for the political elections uh, in uh, uh, West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. So are you saying it was fixed accepted, and accepted that Hamas participated in the elections? I mean. The international community was there with the international electoral observers. So we don't have to forget uh, this part of the long history of the Israeli-Palestinian question. Otherwise, we don't understand that this is a surprise. This, yeah. this What has happened on the 7th of October, 2023, is a turning point and caught all of us, also the analysts, by yeah. surprise. But it had a story behind what and is that story? Understanding. And the story behind is that one. In 2006, uh, uh, the international community sought to give, to put uh, also Hamas inside uh, the framework, inside the political yeah, why, why would they do that? Framework. Why would they do that? I mean, because did they know was, what they were doing? Be, yes. Why sideline, why sideline Fatah? Uh, because Fatah had uh, another part of the story. It was accused by the Palestinian population of corruption, yeah, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's and true. not only that, but in that period, if you remember in 2005, the Egyptian Muslim brothers participated at the yes. election in Egypt. Yes. And uh, it was in uh, Cairo, the factions, the Palestinian factions, decided a suspension in the terrorist attacks in the suicide side attacks that brought so many, caught so many lives of the of Israelis inside the Israeli cities, uh, in front of cafes, inside the buses, and I lived there during the Second Intifada. So I'm also a witness of the fear of the people scared to go out of the house as I was scared. Mm. But in that period, in 2005, 2006, when there was a transition in the politic in the Palestinian political niveau, the idea was to put all together inside a framework. Was it right? Was it wrong? We have still to understand. If, so, Ms. Karidi, why wrong. is it that if I may just interrupt, why is it that Hamas Sorry, then up... so long. No, no, no. It's very interesting. Uh, I just want to you see. I want to get to the bottom of why Hamas up the ante that in the way that they did. I mean, it could not have expected Israel to ignore this kind of butchery uh, that took place on, in the kibbutzim and uh, get away with it. What was the greater purpose? What was the purpose behind it? Uh, you know, to give it a, a wider sort of uh, get attention of the world that, uh, you know, or, or bring uh, Iran in. What is it? What is, what, what set uh, it off? 
Uh, this is a headache, uh, I'm sure, for the um, for me and for all the people to understand, uh, especially the analysts, the intelligence, uh, to understand uh, why this kind of size, uh, with this big size of what is what happened on the seventh. No, the of, scale uh, of, of the butchery the, was, the it scale, was unprecedented. The scale, unprecedented, yeah. unprecedented. If I'm not wrong, uh, Mr. Ambassador will correct me. Is the 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 worst massacre Israel and Israelis uh, uh, suffered in the history of the state? Um, I uh, the headache is first. I think um, Hamas in Gaza, the military wing, uh, wanted to show that Gaza was still in the picture. Uh, because in the, the, the recent years, the idea of not of a Palestinian state, but, uh, because I don't think that Benjamin Netanyahu, and he said clearly, wanted a state of Palestine, but uh, the, the uh, normalization, appeasement with the Palestinians uh, was um, envisioned without the Palestinians at the table with the Bra mm. Abraham Accords. So, yeah. That is, I think, through, the crux of it. Through, through the Arab support, but without the Palestinian at the table. And uh, the Palestine envisioned was only the West Bank, and not East Jerusalem, not Gaza, only the West Bank. And we know that inside the West Bank, the settler movement is uh, radicalizing day by day. And what is yeah. happening inside the West Bank is another black hole and I think in this Israeli-Palestinian question, we don't need black holes. We need to show the picture and to also to show to the world the picture and let the world understand what in reality is in, in the reality is, uh, is happening on the ground. Could you tell yeah. us how Hamas became so popular in Gaza? You know, uh, what is it that, you know, that that makes, I mean, there, there, were, there are 2,000 fighters who took part in this uh, massacre. Uh, I believe it has an army of 40,000 uh, in Gaza alone. And, uh, you know, is, is, this, is this something that, that uh, you know, that can be stamped out, can be eradicated by a ground offensive? If, I mean... If, if uh, you know, the Israelis walk into that, it's like walking into a booby trap, don't you think? As, as a historian, I have to say that we have to differentiate if we want to understand the reality. Mm -hmm. ISIS was a top-down phenomenon that had no relation with the land. Uh -huh. Hamas is a, is a movement that started at the beginning of the 80s rooted inside the Palestinian Muslim Brotherhood. So I think it doesn't fit the, I mean, the picture if we uh, compare ISIS as a phenomenon and Hamas. So Hamas started as the political branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, also because of the defeat of uh, Fatah policies inside the Arab countries, first of all inside Lebanon. And during the civil war. And if I may add something regarding what the ambassador said on the second front, I think uh, we and he missed uh, a part of the picture that is 11 blue elements in the security strip in, in southern Lebanon between uh, Israel and Lebanon. In 2006, when the 33 days war um, mm. happened between Israel and Lebanon, there was no uh, such a situation. Now we have a UN force, the UNIFIL. I have to also to underline the 2,000 of the 11,000 Italians. So I mm. think uh, if uh, a second front will not uh, start, I hope not, we all hope not, it's also because there is a security strip that I remember very well Mrs. Zipilipni, at that time foreign minister in 2006, that, and she was very happy that uh, the, for the Italian mediation in such an agreement and uh, 
for the um, uh, implementation of the of the mission of the Unifil mission in southern Lebanon. But anyway, Hamas started as a political branch for a more religious and social movement, and of course there were different times in a 40 years history, the, the part of the, the pre institutional fr framework I told, I told you before, it is divided in, into a political wing and in a military one that nowadays in the recent years is much more stronger, especially in Gaza, in Gaza, not especially in Gaza. Yeah, in because Gaza, they're saying, they're saying they produce of, uh, their own... They're saying they even produce their own rockets and that they have, uh, you know, access to high tech, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, that that's how they managed to sort of. It was, uh, very, it was very interesting as an analyst, as you said, the what uh, Khaled Meshal said, mm. because Khaled Meshal, it seems to me that wanted to who wanted to put inside the box also Iran and Hezbollah. Yeah. And this is also is changing the, the picture. But what is, I think, also important is that uh, in the history of the structure of Hamas, the political structure, there are four constituencies. So mm -hmm. constituencies that vote for the inside of the decisional process, prisons, West Bank, Gaza, and the abroad. It seems to me that in recent years, this is also part of... Uh, of the updated edition, the military wing is a, a sort of a shadow fifth constituency in the decisional process. I don't know how many people uh, have the the, 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 the the military wing. For sure, the intelligences, the Israeli and the other intelligences in the area will know much more than the historians because I focused on the, on the political structure Anyway, it seems that, uh, or at least uh, what uh, what it seems to me is that the military wing decided this kind of action, and in this kind of the massacre of war crimes in the seventh of October, and in this uh, uh, picture, the question of the prisoners is important. Yeah, because, that's true. Uh, the same Yahya Sinwar, so the head of Hamas political wing in uh, in Gaza, is one of the prisoners released in the agreement. Yeah, yes. Uh, for the liberation of Gilad Shalit, when one thousand and twenty-seven uh, prisoners inside the Israeli jails were liberated. And that when there was a, a, a big fuss in, in Israel when the former premier, Ehud Olmert, accused Benjamin Netanyahu uh, the, of the fact that he accepted such an amount of prisoners to be freed. But because in the recent years, uh, there were, of course, uh, not direct contacts, uh, but through the Egyptians, uh, the file, the, the so-called prisoner file was one of the files in the area, I think that one of the, uh, let's say, of the goals of the of the attack was to take, unfortunately, as much host as much hostages they could as possible. Uh, Miss Karidi, you do you want to uh, uh, give me a con concluding remark on what you see is going to unfold? Yes, please. Um, it's uh, it's hard for me to to sustain uh, the dem dehumanization we are we are seeing because uh, I mean today I saw the images of a church bombarded by the Israeli by the Israeli air force in Gaza. I think uh, we have to think about the human being the same thing as we think think about ourselves each and every human being. So we are seeing a war unfolding, a bombardment and a forced transfer to the south of Gaza of 1.1 million of Palestinians. And if we uh, want to hear the voice of the Palestinians, but they were in the streets in these days, 
But what uh, we as the international community, as analysts and Israel proposed to the Palestinians in the West Bank was, uh, I mean, if you remember in the Israeli press, the attacks on Palestinians were called pogroms by the Israeli journalists in the, in the previous months. And in Gaza, there were five military campaigns and operations by Israel, 2008 and 9, 2012, 2014, 2021, and now. It's not, uh, I think, the tool that Israel needs to live in peace. First, Israel to live in peace and the Palestinian first Palestinians to live in peace. The kind of dehumanization, we will pay the price. We all, all the world globally will pay the price of the dehumanization. Thank you very much, Ms. Karidi. Thank you everyone for watching Global Express. Please click on the new Indian Express website and retweet. Thank you.